very much. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me to uh, provide some uh, uh, remarks regarding the, the forum. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event. It has been a very interesting event for me because uh, <clears throat> it's my first time to attend a uh, Mekong Regional Land Forum. And it's really interesting because you managed to bring a lot of uh, stakeholders, no, uh, ranging from, uh, of course, the the companies, the the researchers, the the civil society organizations, among among others, and and of course the business sector. No, uh, I think that that's this is a very good way of uh, of uh, promoting and uh, talking uh, more deeply about the. ASEAN RAI guidelines and what are the potentials that these guidelines have in terms of uh, ensuring sustainability, ensuring better social uh, benefits, as well as, uh, of course, uh, addressing the interests of both the, public, the private sector and the communities so are the ones who will host some of these investments. Uh, my... Uh, <clears throat> I think that the, the the few things I'd like to highlight and acknowledge as a really great uh, contributions are, of course, first the uh, the whole issue of uh, community land tenure. You know, for indigenous peoples, this has always been the big part of their uh, struggle to to make the governments recognize that they have their own uh, customary land tenure systems because they existed even long before governments came into the picture. And many of the systems, knowledge and practices are continuing up to the present. And it's very encouraging to note that the Mekong countries uh, still uh, have these systems, customary systems in place. Uh, and the governments in their national laws to a certain degree uh, recognize this. And of course, the the RAI guidelines do, does recognize the, the contributions of the customary land systems in terms of ensuring uh, uh, sustainability and increasing the the productivity and utilization of forests. No, and uh, that's uh, that's a very good uh, uh, point to start with because you know in the past. Uh, you, the, in, the indigenous or the traditional systems, customary systems have been denigrated as backward, not in keeping with modern systems, and therefore they have to be uh, to be uh, dealt away with. No, and now uh, evidence uh, shows that uh, indeed, in communities where community land tenure systems exist, uh, they the, the forests are in a much better shape than uh, than other forests. And, and that's the other thing that I would like to, to also appreciate in this forum, because a lot of the work that you have done and also the presentations are, are really evidence-based, no? So these are results of, of uh, researches done, uh, uh, the documentations of situations. And so uh, this cannot be questioned no? when we are pushing for these principles that uh, that uh, we believe in, as well as uh, principles that indigenous peoples are uh, are all have always been fighting for, uh, I think that the 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 way that the the, the forum has uh, uh, has described the contribution of community land. Uh, tenure recognition of community land tenure in terms of ensuring better sustainability, in terms of ensuring inclusion, as well as uh, as building upon existing uh, practices and knowledge, as well as governance systems. It's, it's really uh, something that has to be uh, stressed. Uh, I also note that there have been, uh, uh, that the challenges have been identified, no? And, and of course, the one of the key challenges is really does the while there are national policies in place that does uh, mention that do mention uh, customary land tenure, uh, uh, the the process of uh, of allocating uh, forests for communities has been uh, rather slow, and uh, resources are not. Uh, provided to ensure a more uh, efficient and uh, speedy recognition and allocation of these lands. Uh, so therefore, uh, the, while these customary land tenure systems exist, 
uh, the, the process towards this being formalized into statutory law uh, has also been uh, uh, slow, no? And, you know, many companies, they, they, whenever you ask them whether they are recognizing these rights, their answer is always, well, if there is a law that recognizes community land rights or community land tenure systems, then, of course, we have to follow it. And we know that customary land uh, tenure systems, they are, they are customary. They are not uh, inscribed in the, in the national law, no? So that's why the whole process of recording and documenting the customary land uh, systems is really crucial because how will companies know uh, which of these areas are customarily owned and managed? You know, they have to be, uh, these have to be recorded, documented, and registered. And I'm glad to note that there are processes in several countries that provide uh, land registration certificates to those uh, communities who have been uh, practicing and who still continue to practice this customary land uh, tenure systems. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's really uh, something I appreciate very much. And I hope that the, the groups who have been working on this will continue to contribute to these efforts. I also know that, for instance, the, the, the reports of some companies, they, I can see that they have uh, been engaging not just with the uh, with the, uh, how do you call that, the, the, the and CSOs, but also with the communities, you know, the, and that's the, the third point I would like to mention, this uh, free prior informed consent, no? Uh, it, it really uh, warms my heart to see that uh, free prior informed consent is discussed, uh, you know, in the most uh, uh, candid way uh, and uh, even the companies which who spoke today have uh, mentioned this. Of course, we know for a fact that that's not the norm. No, a lot of uh, private sectors and even some government uh, bodies don't necessarily uh, like to hear about free prior informed consent because we have to admit that the process of obtaining free prior informed consent is not very uh, simple. It's so complex. No, a lot of consultations, information sharing, dialogues, constructive dialogues have to be held until finally uh, we can say that that consent has been obtained. And uh, I appreciate that these uh, private companies have uh, done what they can to obtain free prior informed consent and that the communities are also engaging closely with the local authorities for them to be able to, uh, to have, to, for them to impress on the and the state and in the companies that their free prior informed consent has to be obtained of course uh, uh, we recognizing those uh, difficulties uh, is one thing but seeing how these are being done in practice on the concrete and on the ground is is uh, something that has to be shared widely you know uh, in 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 my stint as the rapporteur it's always that's always a question that uh, a state's race. How do you do it? And are there successful uh, uh, experiences in terms of obtaining free prior informed consent? And uh, it would be very helpful if the documentation of these uh, successful practices will be done and shared more widely, because then uh, governments as well as other companies will realize that it really can work. And of course, the the conclusion also that, you know, uh, by obtaining the free prior informed consent of indigenous peoples and in ensuring their inclusion, uh, there are, uh, this will lead to less uh, risks as well as to more, uh, more stable investment. You know, uh, we have seen, I have seen in many places when the, this is not obtained, the right to have their consent obtained is not done. Then there comes a lot, then what follows normally are conflicts, no? There is a strong resistance. And when the indigenous people start to resist, uh, then again, you can see the, the strong hand of the state being uh, imposed on them. You know, some of them are being harassed, some of them are arrested and criminalized. You know, and this is a reality that we have to also recognize and we have to deal with. Uh, we cannot ignore the fact that uh, there is still a lot of resistance to the assertion of rights of the communities, the indigenous peoples uh, in, in, in my particular, uh, from my particular vantage point. And these are going to, uh, uh, to continue 
to happen for as long as this right is not uh, respected. Uh, of course, the the benefits, no, the benefits that can be obtained by uh, respecting these rights uh, cannot be over, uh, cannot be understated. There are many benefits, not just for the the state, but also for the companies or for in the for indigenous peoples. I always say that you know indigenous peoples are part of nation state building. They are also helping build the nation. So it's in the interest of companies and the government to involve them to ensure that inclusion is a principle that is followed when they are dealing with them. And uh, that, that I saw is also part of the discussions that we have heard so far. Uh, uh, I think that uh, the, the, the potential of, uh, of discussions and forums like this it's, it's very important, you know, I, I, I would hope that there are much more, many more other regions or countries in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN, you know, who will also be uh, benefited from such uh, kind of uh, process where the academics are helping in uh, evolving the evidence, the communities are involved, and the state and the private companies themselves are brought, to, are, are brought together with the communities to talk in more detail how these kinds of uh, principles and standards are going to be operationalized. You know, there are many existing standards. Uh, the big problem really is how to operationalize this. And it was mentioned in the forum that one of the big problems are legal ambiguities or the overlap in legal systems. No, There are legal systems which recognize those rights, but there are also laws which are, I, there are laws which recognize those rights, but there are also laws which undermine those rights. And there is a need to uh, analyze existing laws to see where there are uh, synergies as well as to see where there are conflicts and states should be able to deal with these conflicts using the values and uh, principles of respecting rights as a framework. Uh, so these legal ambiguities have to be addressed as well. Uh, I only have a few minutes left, so I'd just like to say that, uh, again, uh, I congratulate you for uh, organizing this forum. I certainly hope this kind of forum can be extended to other uh, countries as well, into other regions. And uh, whatever report that will come out will be shared widely with other uh, companies as well as with other uh, states and also with indigenous peoples. Uh, indigenous peoples meet among themselves and share also these experiences. And, uh, and you know, uh, as a, a final point, I would just like to say that, you know, uh, by uh, communities being empowered, you know, to know, to be informed of what is going to happen to their communities, to be involved in decision making, and to be able to ensure that uh, good governance and that corruption and illegality will, uh, you know, will uh, persist. Good governance is really a key principle that has to be in place. If we have this kind of picture in several countries and in the Mekong countries in particular, then we can be very proud. We can be, become very proud of this uh, region and uh, make it as a, as a model where such kinds of discussions and processes are discussed and they are used to influence policies and national laws. I congratulate the countries which have come out with their land laws and forest laws, which recognize uh, customary land tenure and free prior informed consent. And I hope that this will be implemented as they should and the communities themselves are involved in designing and uh, and uh, making this real. Uh, there was also a mention of a social uh, you know, forestry enterprises which have been developed that have brought